Hi, everyone, and welcome to Titans Together podcast, a comic book retrospective talking about the Teen Titans from the very beginning, sort of. I'm Joe Pride, and with me, as always, is my co-host. Hi, I'm Geeky JP. Happy to be here. We are on uh, Volume 5, mm -hmm. as it's collected online, which is very, very strange and how they do that. Uh, but we weren't alive in the 80s, and we didn't know how to collect it back then anyway, because we didn't exist, so... Mm -hmm. I think I'm officially the, uh... alive as of issue 26, I think. Or no. I'm not alive well until George Prez and Marv Wolfman have uh, left, the, <laughs> left the book. And we're deep into the 90s, but we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot wait till you have... Uh, I can't wait until you read the 90s stuff to hear what you have to think, because I feel like you're going to have a lot of feelings about it, Stay not there. necessarily in a positive sense. <laughs> But it'll be interesting because it's an entirely group of different characters. Mm. But we're jumping ahead a decade or so. Uh, we're on volume five. Mm -hmm. Where we last left off from the previous volume is Tara had just officially, unofficially introduced herself to the team. We got some very like heavy issues about drug use and what it meant to be uh, a teenager navigating life in the 80s as a runaway in New York, which was like, oddly specific but oddly not specific since we found so much information about what it was like back then online and this first issue kind of picks up where left off tara rejoins the landscape of the titans trying to rob a bank which is strange that like i feel like the titans have met every enemy not necessarily with outright violence but like we're going to arrest you violence like that very energy and with Tara, it's like, wait a minute. Whoa, do you want to join us? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, this doesn't really seem like your MO, but okay. I feel like that's partly because Changeling is sort of the main point of contact for Tara. And obviously yeah. he has interests, <laughs> we can say. It's yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's very strange. It to that effect, too, I wrote in my notes, I was like, there is no chemistry between mm -hmm. the two of them whatsoever. I mean, I don't know what the 80s version of chemistry was, but Beast Boy making very strange remarks about this girl and then her very much being like, I don't like you. No, it's like, do Leave take me a alone. Like, Please yeah. stop. <laughs> let me he run up, let me rob a bank in peace. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like the A story that we have going on in this issue. The B story is about the Brotherhood and- They're trying to kidnap Raven because they think she has information that will make them more capable of invading Zandia. Um, Cause Zandia is Brother Blood's base of operations and he's very powerful there, but the Brotherhood of Evil for some reason doesn't like that. And it's not very clear. Um, I not very clear yet. <laughs> it's so strange. The more that we unfold about this like villain on villain crime, the motivation that ends up being the Brotherhood's like big MO is just like, what? Mm -hmm. Why? The specifics don't make act? sense to me, really. Because they're so like, strange. you know it, but you don't know it. And I'm like, so does she? Like the whole thing makes no sense to me, really, in that regard. But I no mean... sense. And they put Raven through the fucking ringer in this yeah. volume. Oh my god. Full well, on that's... naked torture panel after panel. Not in this issue though. So yeah, you're right. We're skipping. Yeah, that. we'll oh. we'll get to like the craziness that Raven has to endure in this volume, which is just like maddening to me. So back to this issue, we get probably one of your favorite moments from this where Starfire and Robin finally kind of like consummate their relationship. Finishing the volume, I'm like, that was when things were so much better. <laughs> Because things get so much worse. <laughs> yeah, they're immediately having problems in this issue. Um, and it's all Dick's fault. <laughs> I mean, so, <laughs> Starfire is just like, dude, you either tell me what's up or I'm leaving. Yeah. Like, and that is a running theme throughout this entire volume is Dick Grayson just like channeling Batman way too much. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the, the trauma inflicted upon... Uh, <laughs> the trauma inflicted upon Dick Grayson is kind of like being uh, projected through him hmm. with all of his actions. Cause it's insane. Like the lengths he goes in this issue to like get the job done so much so that like, I think Donna was the only one to like really be prescient with like, 
yo, if you break the law, we're not doing that. Mm-hmm. I would have been like that times 10 and been like, dude, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like you're yeah. going way too, you're being way too aggro right now. Like I, need you to calm down. I would argue too. There's a yeah. Weird... But yeah, Corey has a really sad line where she says something to the effect of he's trying so hard to be Batman and to love me would mean he's failed. I'm like, oh, it's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay this is gonna be a running gag until he eventually leaves but uh and this is the month the point in every issue where kid flash contemplates leaving the team and contemplates quitting and contemplates mm. not being a superhero and i'm contemplating just being over it entirely because the dude just needs to pick a lane like you either want to be a hero or you don't i've had this conversation with you at least three yeah. different times because he's not over it yet every time i think he like inches closer to like finally quitting he doesn't and is like mm-hmm. oh i'm dragged back into this and i'm like do you have to be i'll take like the second to last life. issue of this volume he even says to donna i've decided i quit and she's like i think you've made the right decision for you and then the very next issue he's right there with them and i'm like what go go leave <laughs> there are some kind of hints brewing here and i think because marv wolfman and george perez were i think they were two of the writers for crisis on infinite earths hmm. um that I'm starting to see them sow the seeds for that here. And we'll get into like the specifics of that later. But like at that point in time, that's when Barry Allen dies. Spoiler alert. He's, he was dead for 25 years. Uh, that's where Barry Allen dies. That's where a lot of Teen Titans start getting picked off, which we'll get into that later too. Um, but that's when Kid Flash like levels up to becoming the Flash that I knew for the majority of my comic book reading experience until the new 52 and they brought back Barry Allen. But that's neither here nor there i loved wally as flash is the point Mm -hmm. wally as kid flash is insufferable and i just want him to go to college like i just want you to go to college live your like pseudo conservative life gain a little bit more experience and then maybe come back to the Teen titans when you've Mm -hmm. like grown a little because this ain't it even like francis being there for the majority of this volume which i love her by the way she's great she's just like come on we can just go like we can leave immediately that would be a cute B story where like he trains her to use her powers or some shit, but like, no, he's just there suffering for, for what, for nothing because he's the only speedster on the team. Come on. Yes. Yeah. He's just very wishy-washy. He's debating leaving every issue. He hates Raven, but loves Raven every issue. I don't get it. It makes me tired of him. Pick His away. anger towards Raven was like unfounded. First mm-hmm. of all, we get probably the biggest reveal in this issue, which is that Tara had a fake wig in her mask. I'm joking completely, but she had a fake wig in her mask. I was like wondering like, oh, are we gonna get a scene? Cause in the previous volume, she's running around with the Galactus headpiece. She has mm-hmm. like this brunette, Pretty like so. ponytail sticking out. And then it's revealed, she just takes the mask off and the wig's included. And mm-hmm. she has her little bob cut. And I'm like, why did you have the hair? <laughs> Why did you just have it be like a full-on mask? What was the need for the ponytail? It didn't go with the headpiece. I just don't understand. It was so crazy to me. That was like the biggest... I'm just like, what? Girl, what? What is the stylistic choice here? What is the aesthetic? Because I don't get it. We get Donna going to uh, visit Terry and Mm -hmm. meeting a little bit of Terry's like life that we haven't seen yet, at least on the page. That would be his ex-wife and his daughter. And I love the idea of Donna as like a fun stepmom because I feel like she would fit that role so great where she's like not there always because obviously she's a superhero, but like, you know, she imparts some great Amazonian wisdom onto this little girl, but uh, it was very tense. And Mm -hmm. the dichotomy of relationships back in the 80s is something that I'm never going to grasp on like at all. I have no, I don't get why people made certain choices in the 80s about who they chose to date and who they didn't. But that was neat to see. And I'm always here for more Donna screen time in in uh, any regards. And I think this moment is kind of pivotal to the things that we see involving the two of them later on. Mm-hmm. What did you think of everything with Tara? Because we get kind of like everything about Tara's backstory here. We get like Markovia, we get her parents' death, which a Titan trope is the dead parents. <laughs> yeah often uh, accompanied to a teenage hero or heroine is like, mm-hmm. you know, if they're gonna be a hero, nine times out of 10, their parents are dead or about to be dead or 
are like sick. It's just it is. Donna a Donna checks her at one point. She's like, you know, honey, the fact that you're an orphan isn't really unique here. <laughs> <laughs> she's my like my favorite character, both as a hero and as a villain. I think she's very complex. What was your perspective on her? I didn't realize previously just how much Marv broadcasts that she's playing them. Like in more modern adaptations, I think they try to go more for the surprise mystery angle. And this, it's kind of just like she's immediately like, haha, these stupid Titans, I shall trick them. I'm like, was that, that's not a great storytelling entirely, I don't think. But um, I don't know. I feel. Tara rubs me the wrong way. She has a very adversarial relationship to everyone, despite the idea that she's trying to ingratiate herself, which doesn't totally make sense to me. Like, I guess that's I part of her act. This. I was discussing this with Brian. I was like, my boyfriend, I was um, talking about how, like, it kind of seems like Tara's mental health is like, I don't know where it is, like, in terms of the writing, right? I'm never going to know from Marv or George, like what their intentions were in terms of like uh, portraying her as a character. Because like you said, she does like kind of project the fact that she's not really their friend and that she's going to betray them. And it's kind of like, I know what's happening, what's going to happen because I, I know it's like a common point of like pop culture lore that Tara is one of the first characters to, be to betray the Teen Titans. Um, but like, she just is all over the place. I got like really strong like bipolar vibes from her. Yeah. Um, so for me, I didn't know where the line was in the sand in terms of like, is this her mental health showing or is this just her like struggling with the lie that she's like not really here for anybody and she's eventually going to betray them because she's working for Deathstroke. Like it was very strange and I couldn't gauge it. That was the worst part. It was like, okay, there's no definitive like answer here there are other books subsequently down the line that kind of talk more about her backstory i do like that we get a full uh six issues before she announces that she's going to betray the team mm -hmm. i want to know like i wish like teenage me could have been a teenager in the 80s to kind of like revel in this idea because the betraying of a teammate is kind of new i think at this point in comic books in the 80s mm -hmm. so maybe necessarily the writing style isn't something that we adhere to, uh, you know, instinctually, but maybe back then that was something that was very new to the readers was like, oh, this person's going to betray the team. And I had no idea. Like mm -hmm. that was just the writing style. That's the only thing I could figure because she projects so hard that she's just not here for anybody. <laughs> like there's like one moment where she, she kind of like has some strong moments with like Tara for, or not Tara, with Raven for a little bit. And with cyborg but like other than those two key moments it's she's just there to like want all the information about the titans and celebrate her birthday where she turned 16. there we go it was cute, <laughs> it was cute. and then she immediately got mad because she wasn't an official member yet i was like okay girl like can you have a slice of cake first please like they, gave, they got you a whole cake like they knew that like mm -hmm. i don't know when you told them it was your birthday but they knew you know, and that brings us uh, <laughs> that brings us into issue 29, where uh, we kind of get the Brotherhood going on this rampage against the Church of Blood over Raven. Again, like, I don't understand. They must there must be something ingratiated in Raven's psyche that they all know somehow that she doesn't because this torture of her character is just going to continue for the rest of this volume. <laughs> uh, probably another good moment for you is uh, Dick Grayson's training sequence. I mean, we uh, all work out Magento like, Speedos, right? The amount of Speedo energy in this volume is very high for so many characters. I'm just like, what is, what is happening here? <laughs> they just, at every moment, it was like, okay, we got to put another guy in a Speedo, like once per volume whether it's like the simulated pool scene or Dick Grayson or Deathstroke, which we'll get into, like the like weird, like titillating, like man bodiness was, mm. was crazy. How did you, how did you? Uh, I mean, I don't you, know like, that I have more than that, but just, I guess it's the eighties and the way that straight men could wear crop tops and short shorts and things like that in the eighties, because you don't, 
typically see this much flesh in the modern era unless they're very specifically going for a sex scene or something so it is weird that I don't know what's happening like there's it's a I mean George Perez talks about the idea that he's sort of honorary queer in a way but he's a cis hetero man primarily um and as far as I know Marv is too so it's very odd to see this sort of male sexualization it's not something I see very often in comics and I guess it's very it's- surprising especially during like during the 80s the like comic code authority or whatever was like in full force so they couldn't really like push a lot of those kind of buttons like they wanted to but like there's dick grayson in a speedo for like two pages just training and like full-on spread eagleness and i'm just like what is happening here <laughs> i didn't know what i just jumped into with this next issue no, but even okay, more than the cheesecake I- we get the beefcake it's very weird because there's like no corresponding starfire bikini shots in this volume it's just no not even down to like i mean we we've had many conversations about like panel uh, panel choice and like what is like for the male gaze and what isn't but like there's no shots where it's like primarily focusing on a part of a woman's body um whether that be donna raven starfire tara any of them a lot of the the point of view from these drawn drawn panels are like very objective and not very like for any type of gaze so it's very strange that like Dick Grayson was the first one to like really be out there because <laughs> it kind of like I mean I'm not surprised there is a large contingent of the queer community that really likes comic books for like these weird subconscious reasons mm-hmm. I guess mind you I've never read this so I was very taken aback <laughs> like George um, goes to great pains to like depict how sweaty he is it's it's almost uncomfortable <laughs> and then he does it again for deathstroke later on yeah. i'm very very confused george but all right i'm here <laughs> i can't uh i can't get off the ride so amidst all of that training scene it there's some like nice conversations between him and donna where i think donna continues this volume of like or this trait of being the sound of reason for the team mm-hmm. not necessarily the moral compass but like she's very much uh, the co- the core consciousness of mm-hmm. the team. And we get more hints, I think, not only just in this issue, but across the volumes, or across this volume, about her uncertain origin and what that means for her. They're really laying it on thick. And I think next volume, we actually get the who is Donna Troy issue. Fingers oh. crossed. I'm not sure. Um, but it's nice to see it continually talked about because one thing I really think I like about all of this written by George and Marv solely is that they have such a good uh, a great plan like I wish I would have seen like the comic book bible for like them planning out the character beats and the character arcs for these characters because you could tell from volume one that they had like these select plans in place Mm -hmm. it's really cool to see the moment in the issue where Wally inevitably contemplates leaving again this time Raven just tells him to leave and it's fine like no big deal we don't have to love each other but he then, you know, he immediately rescinds and is like, I don't know if I love her and I have to be a hero. It's like, you don't, mm-hmm. you don't. I put in a note just about the general chauvinism that I feel kind of rears its head in this issue, especially between Roy and Dick and Corey and the sort of, well, I don't see your name on her kind of dialogue. It's like, she's a person. She's standing. Right I literally here. wrote that in my <laughs> quotes. It's like, she's not yours. And I'm like, I'm sorry, who's? I'm sorry, she's hers and no one else's? Like, the, excuse you? The fuck? <laughs> Can you shut up? <laughs> Roy is such, like, machismo, like, strong misogynistic energy. And, again, thankfully, like, his character, like, flattens out. But, like, the only thing I could give is, like, uh, just teenage horniness rage, I guess. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know, man. Like, shh, just shh. It is masculinity versus 2020 masculinity. It's part of it too, I think. Like some of just the expectation is, oh, this is what boys do. But I look at it now, I'm like, gross. <laughs> Very <laughs> gross. Ew. We do get a Titan trope in this issue, which is the uh, not necessarily well-known one, but it is one that kind of happens a lot where people, superheroes end up processing feelings on top of Titan's Tower. I think it's Donna and Corey are on the roof talking about Dick, because I think the scene you're Yes, so Corey's on top of the rooftop, kind of like contemplating her feelings. 
her and Donna have this great moment together. That's a Titan trope. That is something that happens so often. The, the top of the tower is uh, this weird point of like reflection and meditation. I don't know if it's because artists really like drawing the landscape, but I'm here for it. It's a very common motif in the comic books uh, that it's cool to see first explored here. Almost immediately following all of this craziness, the Brotherhood breaks into uh, the Titans Tower just as Francis Kane returns and mm. enters the picture again. It's neat. It's nice to see Francis come back. I felt like it was sort of begging the question of how she learned to control her powers because it's another thing that sort of vacillates from issue to issue. They're like, oh, you're not trained. But at the same time, she's perfectly capable when the story requires it. It's a little weird. I get a little frustrated with Fran because again, I don't care for the hero not answering the call as it were. And so the degree that she and Wally are both not into being heroes entirely and the way she acts as a force on him being say, let's just go to Blue Valley, forget this, let people die. And I'm like, eh, not the route I would take, I don't think. Especially since she kind of like holds her own against the Brotherhood very nicely in this issue. When they invade, uh, she is very much like taking them to town for a minute there. Mm -hmm. Like the fight scene was pretty great until Raven was mind controlled by phobia to attack Wally, setting off this strange revenge plot that happens throughout the rest of the volume where Wally just thinks that Raven's a demon. She's the worst. She's the like devil spawn, just like really nonsensical stuff because he knows that phobia controlled her. Mm -hmm. And I guess because he saw like that Trigon kind of lives within her in some capacity, that's his like driving force to be like, throw her off the team. But I'm just sitting over here like, where's your compassion for her? Because she's the one who has to control her emotions to keep Trigon at bay because Arella is not doing her job yet again. It, it, it's just like, why? Like, I just don't understand. It, it was just... Ugh. Wally just in like just suffocates my energy. <laughs> it's insane. It's um, frustrating, I think, too, to watch Raven, who has these psychic powers, be unable to really commune with anyone. Like no one really understands her. There's relatively few heart to hearts with Raven. Um, Cyborg gets a bit of a rapport, but otherwise people are like, we still don't know things about you. It's one of the lines that comes up when they're like, well, we don't know about Tara. And then they're like, well, we don't know about Raven. They're like, well, she's, she's a psychic. She's right there. Like, you hold can hands ask. for a second. And... You don't necessarily like have to ask her what her feelings are because the girl's not supposed to have feelings, but you can ask her what she's dealing with and she can tell you plain as day because she's never, I mean, she's kind of lied to the team before, but she's never been like, a particularly purposeful person to like hide her true intentions regardless of what they may be so they could easily like set her, set her down and like talk to her but they don't whatever <laughs> and at the end of this issue the raven flees uh so issue 30 i put in parentheses happy new year because this is a holiday themed uh issue not very much in terms of like the story beats but it just happens to take place New Year's Eve in the middle of New York. So I thought that was pretty neat. We get more Wally complaining. That's the literally the first line of notes I have. Me too. <laughs> so tired of it. <laughs> we get the Brotherhood back in action. They mm -hmm. do defeat the Titans. Mind you, all, all this is happening. Tara's not technically a part of the team yet. She's just kind of there. She does go to her home in Brooklyn where her and Beast Boy kind of have this conversation that kind of like convinces her to just be there for the team. The weird thing is she doesn't call it her apartment in the context of the story, as I recall. She's like, okay, Changeling, this is where the terrorists were holding me. And he's almost immediately like, they were? That's like, right. It's like, this story doesn't make a ton of sense. And then she bats her eyes at him and he drops it. But Very <laughs> much. <laughs> One of the biggest beats of this issue is that Scarpelli from the previous volume is freed from prison. Mm -hmm. The drug smuggling, kid capturing douchebag is mm -hmm. set free on a technicality, which kind of sets uh, Dick Grayson and Adrian Chase from the last volume on this revenge tour of trying to get Scarpelli back into prison or 
in some cases trying to kill Scarpelli. Like I didn't realize he was going to be such a main focus of this volume, especially considering like he was barely in the last one and he was like the main antagonist of mm-hmm. the last couple issues. I mean, it's interesting. I think it explores Marv wanting a little more grounded stories versus all epic space battles and demons from other dimensions. Um, I think it displays something interesting with Dick's character and that he's consumed with the Scarapelli thing all along. And there's that whole discussion of, oh, he's trying to be Batman, he's doing too much. But at the same time, Adrian Chase is like even worse. And there's this sort of rivalry between them where Robin's still sort of trying to hold him back and be like, we need a warrant, we need to follow the law. If I knew you were just gonna go in half cocked, I wouldn't be here. But then by the end, that's also where Robin is anyway. <laughs> it's, it's very strange. The, it's the, like, the battling like male energy between this full grown ass man <laughs> and this teenager who is very like, high adrenaline, high emotion, like imbalanced, like chemicals Mm -hmm. as a teen, like just duking it out to see who can like get real close to breaking the law (laughs) before they actually do it, which Adrian Chase ends up winning. The adult ends up Mm -hmm. winning that and breaking the law. We get a change of heart for Bethany Snow. Uh, (laughs) Can't trust the blonde in this universe, except for Francis, I guess. Um, because she's like trying to ready to confess about brother blood and all this other nonsense. Mm -hmm. And then immediately we realize, oh no, she's trying to like play the double agent, which like Bethany, get out. Like, I'm so sick of you. I don't like, I I deal with Tommy Lauren in the real life. I don't need to deal with Bethany Snow and T Titans. (laughs) Like she can just leave. Um, Is she a precursor to Gilbert Godfrey or just sort of, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's just a common trope in literature or pop culture that like Fox News exists and they <laughs> come along with different interpretations of them. But this is the Teen Titans one is Bethany frickin' Snow who mm. can't seem to like stay off of a panel. Um, but she doesn't really show up outside of that like change of heart, but not really. Mm. Cyborg does go to visit Sarah finally. Mm -hmm. And we find out that she's engaged, uh, unbeknownst to everybody. And that's all we can really say about Sarah until a couple issues from now, where we'll have greater lengths of discussion about why they're fucking up my favorite character, favorite side character. This issue, issue 30, the New Year's issue, is where Tara is officially inducted as a member. Mm -hmm. She's not given all of the keys to the castle. She's just like, you're here. You're going to show up in like all of the covers of the comic books and be in the background of the panels, uh, which she doesn't like because she wants to know everything about the Titans. But it's nice to know that she's like officially a part of the team. Mm -hmm. Oh, we do get some like interesting things about religion because Raven frequents a church as her point of fleeing away from the Brotherhood where Phobia follows and kind of not begs Raven to take the fight outside, but kind of like for fear of religious prosecution is like, I need you to go outside Mm because this is like a religious safe space and we can't fight here. Which makes no sense to me. I'm like, ma'am, you just gave this woman, this teenage girl, like years of PTSD via your like nightmare powers. And now you want to be like, wait a minute, God, we have to go out. Like, (laughs) I don't, I don't understand. And Raven was just there kind of like, she talks to like a priest at one point and is mm-hmm. like trying to wrestle with the who she is as a person. So it was just all very strange. How do you reflect on like that weird uh, religious angle that we took in this issue? I mean, I think it's a natural choice for Raven. She even in her words describes herself as the daughter of Satan, I think, when she's talking to the priest. And that demonic element obviously sort of calls for in a way it cries out for a more counterbalancing holiness, whether or not you believe in Catholicism or the like. Um, I think especially in the 80s, there is this trend where if religion, then Catholicism. Um, So that's how we end up in the cathedral. Uh, And I think part of that is also just like the set trappings, like it's a more dramatic scene to be in a big church than like a little prayer room. Um, But I mean, 
was neat. I wish it could go further. I was very honestly intrigued with the priest character because I have less than stellar experience with priests. And so the idea of one actually being kind and helpful is, it's appealing. It's something I would like to see, but that's kind of denied by the story. Um, the fight just sort of pushes on. But it would be neat, I think, to see Raven grapple with Faith, especially in the yeah. idea of the way it could maybe bolster her, provide more emotional grounding. I mean, Azeroth is a religion in a way, I would say. It's an extremely strict philosophy. Um, and it's not the healthiest either, I feel. You see a lot of Raven, like, she has to control her emotions because Trigon. But on the other hand, like, the total emotional shutdown, that's not really controlling your emotions, that's denying your emotions. And so I think that's where a lot of Raven's problems come from. She is in this like no go zone where nothing flies and that's untenable. Yeah, I think it was really interesting to hear her talking about religion and reflect on your words too, because in the cartoon, there's that one, there one episode where Beast Boy and Cyborg are kind of like transported into her soul self and you see all of the different representations of Raven and their different personality traits kind of like coming with the conclusion of like you need to show some emotion sometimes or else you're just going to go crazy and we haven't reached that yet in the comic book so hopefully we get there soon because I think all of this denying of emotion and all this use of her empathic powers you run the risk of Trigon escaping very easily but we'll 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 uh, saunter on past the religious uh, raven stuff into, uh, we get a, another, uh, not a rematch, but like uh, an actual ride out fight between the Titans and Fran, because technically she's not a member, she's just chilling, mm -hmm. and the Brotherhood in Times Square on New York, it's crowded AF. We get, oh, this is where it ends. So the only person who's not there to attend to the fight is Donna because Donna was just proposed by Terry. And that is kind of like how the issue ends amongst this, uh, this fight scene in Times Square. And I'm very excited because I like Terry. I think Terry's a nice guy and I love Donna. So, you know, we get, we get a lot of contemplation about like, will they, won't they? I'm very much of the like, yes, do it, do it. I don't like marriage as a concept, but like, I think it'd be cute for you two to do it. <laughs> Uh, how do you reflect on the ending of this issue? Um, I mean, I am not heretofore a Terry fan, but getting to know him more, I mean, he's fine. To think about how <laughs> Wolfman's perspective was he needs to be an older established man because Donna is too impressive for a fuckboy, essentially. And I can buy that. I guess. <laughs> um. We'll move on to uh, issue 31. I, again, my first notes in this is Wally still holding a grudge. Because of course he is. He's so mad at Raven for possessing, uh, or for like attacking him because she was controlled by phobia. We get some funny like meta commentary from Tara where she kind of reflects on like how goofy some of this stuff is. And I'm like, are you breaking the fourth wall? Are you meaning to do this? I was very here for it because it's a character trait that she often doesn't have. It's not quite like Deadpool levels of breaking the fourth wall. She's just like, guys, we're fighting in Times Square. This is ridiculous. Like, I want to not be here. <laughs> She's like, can we just beat the bad guys and go? And I'm like, I love to the point, Tara. Yes, please. Oh, we also have to talk about, I totally forgot about this. Her name being of hot contention in, in the first volume because uh, her code name is Tara, meaning Earth. Uh, but her actual name is Tara. Like her name is Tara, but then her superhero name is Tara. So why didn't you just call her Tara to begin with? This strange distinction that they established at the beginning of this volume is very odd to me, but there it is. I feel like I needed to say it. Raven is captured by the Brotherhood, taken to Zandia, where they each take turns of violently torturing her. And it's awful. <laughs> mm. Like, Every one of the Brotherhood just bulls out the ring here. They get her like right where she's about to either pass out or die. And then they're like, okay, next villain up. Ultimately resulting in phobia, giving her like this traumatic, like lived in demon experience, like experiencing her worst fears. 
it's just madness. I'm not crazy about the torture of Raven. It's super graphic. It does get a little gazy in the whole she's naked and the hordes of people crawl on her sort of thing. It's a little, it's a little gross. <laughs> um, uh, I think, let me see here. It's also just weird because after all of that torture, Mala and the brain like, reason with her and she sort of stockholm sympathizes with the brotherhood like from that point on she's just sort of chilling with them it's very like enemy and my enemy is my friend vibes but like girl you just went through torture with you went through literal hell fi- not literally but like figurative hell with them like and now you're just like oh they hate brother blood because he went through a portal that i made once so i'm with them now or not with them but like i'm existing cohabitating with them now and it's just like I'm no <laughs> like ma'am no <laughs> this is why you don't deny your emotions <laughs> you're, mm. you're acting all you know not right that that's where we get like the reveal that the brotherhood's ultimate intention is to figure out the source of brother blood's powers a question that we were pondering last volume which doesn't get answered <laughs> in no. this volume not frustratingly yet. enough I think this is the last brother blood issue for a little while yeah, well. for the rest of the for the rest of the volume, at least, just like, where are we going to get an answer? Like, I'm very confused. Just, they weren't there when they they weren't there when Brother Blood was fighting the Titans. So how do they know mm-hmm. that he miraculously just stepped through her force or her soul self, like it was nothing? How do they know this? Yeah. They weren't there. And how do they know that so she questions. learned something and then she learned it but doesn't know it, and that never gets resolved either. It's a it. It's so strange. But the Titans come to the rescue. They fight the Brotherhood on Zendia yet again. I didn't realize that Zendia was going to be such a setting in Titans comics because it doesn't exist when I was reading. (laughs) At least to my knowledge, I didn't know it existed. We get Raven's nightmare kind of manifesting itself because she kind of loses control for a minute. Mm -hmm. And we see like the face of Trigon over her. She's talking in those like red demon Trigon bubble word bubbles. But luckily, good old Donna, voice of reason and consciousness, is there to, like, calm her down and, like, seclude Trigon back to the depths for a minute there. It's it's her feeling something, which is cool. Um, (laughs) It makes you feel really bad for the character that she has this hanging over her. I think it's weird in the way it's worded as, like, the excitement of the battle calls out to her there's like this she feels tinges of like bloodthirstiness or sort of the root of evil and i find that just kind of weird because that doesn't seem like raven i'm very it begs the question like it begs the question if trigon's influence is the only thing fueling her uh her like dark side right Mm -hmm. like is and it think, actually just Trigon or is it a part of her that she doesn't know about? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And does she not know about it because the people of Azeroth are so weird? <laughs> to, like, the you can't feel any emotion is just a weird-ass rule. I don't like it. It's... I don't know how you do it. I mean, I came out of the womb just full of emotions. I don't, like, how do you deny that? It's crazy. Which is why, like, she is so, like, volatile with her mm-hmm. powers. Which is why she needs to stop using her empath powers, by the way. Like, girl, stop. (laughs) The more you add, the more it, like, makes you just unable to control them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, another fun fact I forgot to bring up is issue 29 was the official half point of this first run. Like, we are halfway through Marv Wolfman and George Perez's run on the Titans. Little moment of congratulations that we've gotten this far. (laughs) At the end of this issue, they defeat the Brotherhood. They escape again. Hello. Uh, Raven repels Trigon. And then at the end of the issue is Wally still grudging. Because of course it's Wally still grudging. Okay. Now to like what I consider the more exciting half of this volume. Mm -hmm. Because we get a lot of stuff in these last ones. Issue 32 starts out with a Titan trope, which is the Titan cameo. And our first appearance for Thunder and Lightning. They feel a little racially insensitive was my first reaction. <laughs> um, I think- it was a little, it was a little Mandarin-y mm. in terms of like representation. I did like, first of all, that we are getting more diversity in the Teen Titans lineup because it has been like 
mostly Caucasian and then Cyborg and Beast Boy by default because he's green. But, you know, so it's cool to see that we are getting more diversity on our lineup, even though they're not necessarily a part of the team yet. However, their origin story is like weird AF. I don't think they talked to anyone who was Vietnamese no, uh, before think, making these characters. I don't think their names are Vietnamese. Gon and Tavis just seem made up. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's, I don't think it's awkward. I mean, it's the Very 80s, awkward. and that's how things went in the big two comic companies in the 80s. But it's insensitive, and it's like, guys, could you? I guess Google didn't exist, but <laughs> Google Vietnamese names, like anything. Or like look up an encyclopedia <laughs> or go to a library or talk to somebody who is Vietnamese. I would love to see. I want to reboot the Teen Titans so bad, <laughs> bar none. Like I'd love to like rewrite these stories and put a little bit more like modern nuance to them because I feel like both Thunder and Lightning have like so much potential to be such cool representatives of Vietnamese culture and mm. of diversity for the Teen Titans that, I mean, here they're kind of just on this rampage to find their father and that's kind of like the one note for them, the entire issue, which is kind of weird. You mean, you draw similarities to the cartoon too. Their characters in the cartoon, their one note in terms of they just wanted to have fun to have mm -hmm. fun. So I guess it kind of tracks, but like for characters that continue to show up in the Titans lore, uh, I need a little bit more, one, sensitivity to the Vietnamese culture and two, a little bit more character. Like there's so much potential for them to be really interesting. And I love their power sets. Like mm. one controls thunder and then one controls lightning. And like when one starts their powers, the other one can't help, but start theirs. I think that's really cool. So there's a lot there. Like somebody like write these characters better, please. Or like not even better because like it was the time of the, mm. the it was the era of comic books where like necessarily research wasn't necessarily a, a part of the, a part of the curriculum when it comes to writing characters of different races, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? But somebody needs to do it. Like, I really like these two. I love their outfits. Uh, mm -hmm. The orange and blue dichotomy between them is really cool. Like clashing colors, but they're brothers. It, they're actually in St. Louis, which was a weird change of pace. I was so used to all of the Titans problems being in New York, but, or Zandia. But to go to St. Louis was an interesting change of pace that I saw that like, What's the arch thing? Is it called I think the arch? It's just the St. Louis arch, I believe. Yeah, I get to see that in the background of every panel, which was neat. This is where we get Kid Flash's origin story, which I don't know if we had gotten up until this point. He was just there helping Barry one day, and the same thing happened because mm -hmm. comic books. Which I guess, I mean, it doesn't really add any dimension to a character I really don't care about, but here we are. I think it's also interesting the telepathic link that Thunder and Lightning have. A really interesting choice to have them talking in thought bubbles. I was kind of lost mm -hmm. for a minute at the beginning, but then I got it later on. Also a really cool power to have. I didn't know that they had that because they didn't really do that in the cartoon either. Right. And they're not really featured in the uh, issues that I read from the mid-2000s. They make one appearance or two appearances in the background of like some great big group fights. But other than that, they're not really featured. I need more of them. <laughs> I like them. They're on the search in St. Louis for Walter Williams, the father that abandoned them because he was in the war, which I guess was something that commonly happened back in the Vietnamese war. Uh, I know that was a, a plot point in Watchmen written by Alan Moore because the comedian had a woman pregnant in mm -hmm. Vietnam. It, honestly, in that regard, I think it was less unsensitive and disturbing than it could have been because the second I saw Vietnam and war on the comic panel words, I'm like, oh, this is gonna go really badly. And actually comparatively didn't, but um, I think to a degree, Thunder and Lightning do touch on that idea that America trashed Vietnam and left is that's the narrative they very quietly play out without necessarily pointing fingers but yeah and then they come to America looking for answers meanwhile Wonder Girl is kind of left in charge because Dick Grayson is just kind of absent after the fight on Zandia he just kind of went MIA mm -hmm. leaving everyone especially Corey left with burning questions that will never get answered at least in this volume I really did like Donna Troy 
taking the reins and really being the leader because that's mm-hmm. how I feel she is. Ironically, every character who has had the Wonder Girl moniker, I like them being the leader. That includes Cassie, that includes Donna. Like, I don't know. I think it's just like Amazon training. Like they just know how to be a team leader because I think she kind of navigates this conflict very well. Like Mm -hmm. she doesn't want to fight thunder and lightning. She wants to talk to them and figure them out. We get that team compassion. (laughs) She does have to check Tara for like her witty comments at the, in the issue at some point, which was fun. Who's just constantly in the background of the panels making snide remarks, which Mm -hmm. I kind of (laughs) love. I'm like, Tara, you're so dumb, but like, I'm here for it. Okay. (laughs) I'm along for the ride. We do get a little bit of a familial connection, some lore behind Donna Troy. She does have a sister in the FBI towards the end of this issue. She uses her sister to kind of find out about Walter Williams. And we get two conflicting stories. So Thunder and Lightning think that he was a medical soldier, I think, right? He was like a advisor, an advisor in the war, got a woman pregnant and then left. And then we come to find out that his her father is still wanted by the FBI. Uh, my understanding is Donna lies to Thunder and Lightning and tells them that he's dead to sort of pacify them and then says, we're going to research the truth. And then she explains that he was some sort of top secret scientist. One of the comments she makes is that the data is really spotty, like there are no details, but... He was a scientist, he altered his DNA, which is probably why his kids have powers and that he disappeared. Um, She doesn't know what he's wanted for or what his research really was or any of that. So it's a big plot point left open. Yeah, I mean, and I hope they go back to it because again, when I was reading comic books, none of this was explored. Nothing nothing about Walter Williams, nothing about Thunder and Lightning outside of them fighting and helping the team at certain points. So I need to know more. I want to know more. I really like Thunder and Lightning entering the fold in a way. More so than I like Roy and Wally. Like, you can swap the two out for them, and I would be more than happy. (laughs) I would be ecstatic to have them on the team versus Wally and Roy. Because Roy Harper is just cringe. This entire issue. Just, boy, shut up. Like, damn. (laughs) I'm just so over it. He just does not know when to, like, calm it the fuck down like mm. put it away for like two seconds they're trying to like donna's trying to lead the team and he's just over there making like these sexist remarks like please shut up we end the issue with thunder and lightning going to star labs i love the greater connection to the dc universe at large before getting us into issue 33 which gives us our next titan trope again is the titans cameo which is going to be a common titan trope throughout all of the teen titans runs Again, and I reiterated a lot previously and I do it now, like I love the legacy characters returning and I love more characters being added, not to the roster per se, but like as allies for the Teen Titans who are all teenagers subsequently. I mean, I don't have the frame of reference in that like I don't recognize, oh, Aqualad, I remember this adventure. So it's just sort of more, oh, Aqualad, he's here. But um, (laughs) it does ground the titans it's good to know there's a world beyond them without quite that level of crossover segue oh we get that towards the end of this volume (laughs) where i have so many questions so issue 33 opens up with this like murder mystery Mm -hmm. aqualad kind of drops a body (laughs) before the teen titans and he's like you have to figure out who killed this man and then i'm leaving and he does which is like I want Aqualad to stay there more too. He's Mm -hmm. not even that bad. Like, again, why are Roy and Wally the only Titans who decide to stay? Like, please, no, give me, give me Aqualad. Give me Thunder and Lightning. Give me anyone else. Amidst them pondering what could have happened to this character, Trident, uh, a villain, uh, we get them on a virtual vacation. So they're like poolside, but not really because it's some like, danger room-esque thing cyborg set up where we kind of get these sequences i guess where each team each portion of the team right they encounter trident at different points throughout the same day so we got gar and vic donna and raven and then wally and tara all interacting with try again at different points during the same day i thought they were great character moments where like not necessarily i mean gar and cyborg have had conversations bonded 
-hmm. we know them as characters so they're pretty solid in their instance and interaction with trident but for the other two donna and raven and wally and tara especially how did you feel about like them fighting trident and like quipping and that whole interaction it's good i think that Each of them is a relationship that needs to be fleshed out more, Um, especially I think the trio of Donna, Corey, Raven, I just want so much more there in general. Um, And it's sort of a neat, cute, subcontained story. Like if you needed to throw in a one-shot story, then this murder mystery is sort of a cool idea. Again, it grounds it in real life versus the space aliens, wizards, robots sort of thing. it's a cool story. I like that so, um, Corey is the linchpin in a way. She's the one who figures it out and is like, guys, didn't you? <laughs> and that's after she comes back, right? Yes. Yeah. So prior to that, we get this nice B story of Corey kind of trying to find where the heck did Grayson went. And we get our other Titans cameo, which is Jason Todd as a redhead, which I always forget. I'm always used to him being like having black hair because it's so common within like canon that he's a he has brunette hair but now he's a full-on redhead when we first meet him and he's equally as bratty like just he's i don't know how i'll put up with him like we don't see much of him he gets a few lines but like his last line of when do i get to join the titans and i'm like oh uh, <laughs> i knew you he does spend one or two issues on the titans it's not a good mix but we'll get there we do end up finding out where Dick Grayson has been this whole time. He's with Adrian Chase and they are on this revenge trip after Scarpelli. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why no one can find him. That's when Corey kind of enters the fray of the Titans, the A storyline, and tells them, yo, it's three different people. It's not not just one. They find the people who are dressed up as Trident. We find out that they're working for Hive. So Hive is still in the play, in the background, just scheming away. We don't necessarily see the purple robes and hear them talking about their grand power and yada, yada, and so forth. (laughs) But it's interesting to note that this character is in the fray of the Titans mythology because of Hive. We do end with a cliffhanger, which is Dick Grayson and Adrian Chase. They bust in on Scarapelli. I think it was more sort of just like dinner at home versus a big event. But yeah, like they bust through the window outright, as I recall. It's very very much the opposite of things by the book which becomes a problem for dick (laughs) very much so and then right before we move on to issue 34 we do get a fun uh we do get fun moments with tara again i love like every tiny interaction she has here i am going to gush because she's my favorite character her stuff with wally was fun because she's just telling him to like not be an idiot (laughs) at certain points during the fight and kind of like really proving herself to the team here even though we know she's going to betray them On to issue 34, we have two Mm. more left. Two of the like most heavy issues, I'd say, especially the annual number two is, there's just so much happening. Before we get there, issue 34 features the daddy death stroke, as I put in my notes, because it opens up, and I hate using that phrase, I always hate using that phrase, but he's there like working out in a Speedo with Wintergreen just watching, and I'm just like, are y'all fucking? Like, (laughs) it's so weird. Like, he's just watching Deathstroke work out. And, like, Mm -hmm. especially right now, we get uh, more lore about Deathstroke's life. He does have a family. We get the Adeline Wilson name drop, who becomes a very famous character within the Titans lore. But for a minute there, I'm like, Wintergreen ain't just your butler, is he? Like, what is happening here? Mm, It's very strange, but okay. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about these big plans he has to fight the Titans. He doesn't like using the word failure. And that's how he sees himself because he still hasn't fulfilled the contract from Hive to kill the Titans. And then we quickly move on to it's Tara's birthday. She is now 16. I think one of the youngest Titans currently on the roster, which is all happy until she starts getting mad that she doesn't know all of the Titan secrets yet. We know she's eventually going to tell Deathstroke all of these secrets. Mm-hmm. But I wanted more of like happy time Tara, where she was like, you know, happy to be on the team, happy mm-hmm. to be involved. I think reflecting upon it now, and we haven't even gotten into the Judas contract. None of this stuff was isn't in the like collected edition of the Judas contract, which was mm-hmm. kind of sad. I liked seeing like 
Tara on the team, regardless of, we know she betrays the team or not. I liked seeing the teamwork that they had, the camaraderie they had at certain points. Cause it makes me feel so much when she betrays the team, Mm -hmm. Uh, which is why I really like the show's version of Tara. I think this took all of the best, the cartoon took all of the best moments of Tara from this source material and really like molded this great story arc of tragedy and unbeknownst heroism. I don't even know if, her outcome in the cartoon is the same outcome in the books because I can't remember the Judas contract to save my life. My memory is fleeting, clearly. But it's interesting to see like the translation and how much is lost in translation too. Like I wish uh, that this would have had a little bit more weight to it like the cartoon does. And then I do mention like her kind of signs of like mental health being a challenge. I did kind of write maybe bipolarism or something like that of that nature because she just flips on a dime Mm -hmm. like it's just instant and then it goes from like happiness to anger to she's crying on like the titan's computer because she feels like she's not a part of the team and a part of the family it was just so fast so many emotions Mm -hmm. so quick i'm just like girl take a breather like again have a slice of cake it's fine like you will be good scar scarapelli is re-arrested mm-hmm uh, on a technicality that Adrian Chase kind of set up. So is he really arrested? Is he really not? A lot of that weird legal mumbo jumbo. I'm just like, okay, is he like guilty or not guilty? <laughs> I just want to answer. <laughs> I mean, the Scarpelli thing is architecting an overall Titans issue, I think, and that question of to what degree they operate in the law, can operate in the law. As Donna's dialogue shows, like, at least for her, it's very important that they be on the up and up. But even earlier, like, the brother blood thing put them very much against the standard legal proceedings. And so it's weird to have, like, discussion of warrants brought up. Titans never have a warrant. Um, Donna's never going to have a warrant. I don't understand that aspect of it. But yeah. It is interesting because Scarapelli is the one who leads Robin off on this sort of tangent quest, folly. Like I'm reminded of in the cartoon, Robin gets this obsession with Slade and must Mm -hmm. figure out Slade and take down Slade. And I kind of see sort of a similarity here where he's sort of obsessed with gotta make Scarapelli pay, especially after this issue. I mean, it's it's definitely strange. I mean especially for a character he like you said I feel like I would have had much more connection if he was like doing like what the cartoon did where he was just actively after Deathstroke in the way that he's after Scott Apelli here with Adrian because I mean what he did to those kids really awful really disgusting however he did watch Deathstroke's son kill himself essentially because of his father so it's like this weird like power play of like which one should he be angry at more? We do get uh, a little bit more context because amidst Tara's kind of tantrum, uh, Sarah Sims calls and wants to talk to Cyborg, who has been lamenting these past couple of volumes about the fact that Sarah is engaged, didn't tell him that she was engaged, which she didn't have to tell you if she was actually engaged, mm-hmm. dude. Like, you can be friends and, like, she doesn't have to tell you that. Like, that's not an information thing that, like, is out and about, like, public knowledge. Like, you don't what calm down wolfman sir. spins it into this i'm angry at her because she lied to me but that's a very nonsensical like she didn't tell you she was engaged that's not a lie that's irrelevant info <laughs> very like the most irrelevant so he doesn't take her call he kind of blows her off come to find out that she was never actually engaged mark is just an abusive douchebag who was kind of like holding her hostage in her own freaking apartment uh until like sarah sims kicks his ass and throws him out of her apartment and i'm like I, that was i was most excited about that i was like yes sarah like i'm rooting for you as a side character screw him he's a douchebag mm-hmm. and the janitor just watching it unfold at the end was hilarious to me but that again like that's all we get about sarah uh hopefully like i say every volume we get more of her <laughs> later on this is where Gar convinces Tara to calm down a little bit because she had just sort of freaked out and been like, you tell me everything or I'm quitting in a week. And so he sort of talks her down a little and then they suddenly get 
a surprise call from Deathstroke where he has the stockbroker tied up and is like, okay, Titans, get here, or the stockbroker gets it. And then Tara makes the, in my opinion, very, well, I mean, we know why it happens, but hard to understand choice of smacking Gar in the back of the head and then running off to prove herself by taking down Deathstroke on her own. And um, it works, I guess. Like, I mean, we, we do all, we all know that at this point in the book, it's fake. It's all just meant to like prove to the Titans that she's like the real material. However, I kind of believed the lie for a minute there. I really liked seeing Tara use her powers to the greatest of her abilities, mm -hmm. in air quotes, not greatest of her abilities. So obviously, she was doing stuff underhanded to make sure Deathstroke wasn't actually hurt all that mm -hmm. much. But it was a fun fight scene, nonetheless. I was definitely engaged with it. And for like a brief like millisecond, I was like, oh, she's actually like kicking his ass. I'm so here for this. And then you realize like she built a tunnel for him to... Yeah escape from underneath and is the grand reveal at the end of this issue uh after they induct her induct her into the titans uh, officially that she is a spy and has mm -hmm. been working the long con this whole time and is working for deathstroke and this is his big plan all along the judas contract brings up some crazy talking points which we'll get into next volume but this is the beginnings of it this is where mm -hmm. like the reveal happens Yep. And we both know the reveal. I think Tara's betrayal is like arguably one of the most iconic comic book stories because it wasn't really done at the time. Like heroes betraying heroes to reveal themselves as villains. I don't know if before this it was common. I mean, okay. we have like the Dark Phoenix saga, but the Dark Phoenix saga necessarily wasn't, it wasn't Jean's fault. She was kind of possessed. Like mm -hmm. this is like Tara acting on her own volition she is, albeit manipulated by Deathstroke, which we'll find out later, but like, this is like the OG, like actual villain hiding as a hero. Mm -hmm. Which so I the think- The closest is thing I can think of is the Quanon Betsy thing in the X-Men of the nineties where- Yes. We're like, yeah, exactly. But again, that wasn't the same. There, I can't no. think of another instance where it's like, here's a new hero. Oh, by the way, they were secret villain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it happens- Century? It happens a lot in Teen Titans uh, to the point where like, this is the the first Titan trope. Well, not the first time we've talked about the Titan betrayal as a Titan trope, but this is one of them. This is arguably the most iconic. It does happen quite often I mean, in Ravager Titans lore. Ravager pulls the same thing, right? Uh, Ravager is gonna pull the same thing more or less, for example, uh, right? No, actually she doesn't. She starts out as a villain and then turns it into uh, a hero. This is the opposite. There is somebody in her storyline that is that, but it's not. <laughs> I love Rose Wilson just saying like, ooh, Rose Wilson is so good. Okay, I'm just not, I'm not going to gush. That's like my era of comic books and Rose Wilson is amazing. Like explosive conclusion where Robin and Adrian Chase are discussing kind of like the ethical boundaries that they're breaking mm -hmm. just before Robin leaves. And there's a toy that blows up, which makes me thought, I thought it was Toy Man first. Yeah. Um, or the puppeteer who somehow lived, even though he was killed by the hive. Uh, I thought it was one of them. Nope, it's Scott Apelli who bombed their apartment, killing all of Adrian Chase's family, mm -hmm. which is so sad, <laughs> but leads us into the annual number two. Uh, he's rushed to the hospital. His family's all dead. Uh, this is where the Titans kind of like have their like finally they're re reunited to like kind of discuss all their issues and air out grievances which was weird like in the middle of a hospital while you're waiting to find out if somebody's alive or dead you all want to talk mm. about like drama <laughs> i was very like okay you all are teenagers this would not be the time nor the place to talk about this kind of thing if you guys were adults we are all we are introduced to donna osida i think that was her last name who is the godmother omicidio oh, Omicidio, I was, I think, uh, there were so many names in this issue. I was just like, okay, who's the next person? Cause it was a lot. I was just um, calling her the godmother. Honestly. Yeah, we'll just call her the godmother. <laughs> so it's the godmother, which I loved by the way. Uh, I'm here uh, super formally dressed in a pantsuit, two piece grandma, head of the uh, mob. Something you don't come and see is a mm -hmm. matriarch, the villain, like, there's no godfather. I guess, I don't know if Marv and George were trying to like play on the godfather because 
that was this was around the time when one of those movies was out. Mm-hmm. I've never seen them, but I know they came out around the eighties. Mob movies are not my thing. It's mm-hmm. but it's cool. I like the Godmother. Uh, she's sassy. She is no nonsense. Mm-hmm. She puts Scott Apelli in his place and is like, "I will kill you if you stop fucking up." <laughs> And I'm here for it because I don't like Scott Pelly, but I like the Godmother. I mean, it's a tense moment. It is really starting to pull to a head the Corey Dick thing in particular because he was already kind of off base with the Scarapelli thing, but now the death or it's the death of Adrian Chase's family and the injury of Adrian Chase. And that kind of drives Robin off the deep end where he's immediately like, I have to avenge him. Everything I was just arguing with him about, about procedure, I don't care about anymore. Um, So it's a tough moment for the Titans. It also though provides some more grounding for Donna because like you say, she then comes in and gets to have the position of Dick or going a little crazy. Um, Yeah. Thankfully, I love when Donna's like, can you not? <laughs> she's, she's just like, we're like trying to be superheroes here and your vendetta isn't welcome a part of the team. Like, it's just not not here. Like, we don't need it. Scott Apelli, we get some character beats of him, surprisingly, where he's like, I need backup and I there's only one person I need to call and it's the monitor. And I'm like, wait a minute. I don't know for reference, have you seen or read Crisis on Infinite Earths, the George Perez Marvel Wolfen book? Great book. We might do an issue about it because so many Teen Titans end up dying in it. Mm. This isn't the big cosmic monitor. This is a yes. different monitor. Yeah, okay. Well, so yes and no. So the monitor is the antithesis to the anti-monitor as it would kind of sound like it is. But, you know, in the book, he's a good guy. He mm. kind of... Uh, grabs different characters from different universes to try and salvage the universe. But here he's like supplying low level, like I'm going to say like F list villains to Scott Apelli to like keep him safe. Mm -hmm. Cause we even get Lila who is the harbinger here in like this cute purple outfit, but like she's full on helping him. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, I thought the monitor was a good guy. I don't understand where the change happens, but this is definitely a precursor to Christ on Infinite Earths. The weirdest one, because it makes no sense why he's doing this. I mean, this is the first time we get a character reveal for him because we have seen in certain panels, this little orb flying in the middle of space above earth uh, throughout all of the volumes. Just, we never really needed to comment on it. It just is something that's always been there. And this is the first time we're revealed as to who it is, even though we don't necessarily see his face yet. Yeah, just strange. I don't get it. But he has the know-how to get all of these other villains to help Scatapelli and to keep him safe. You know, whatever that means. We get like this cross uh, examination for Robin uh, during this like legal battle. To be honest, I glossed over a lot of it. I was like, this legal mumbo jumbo, I don't care about. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you felt about like what they were trying to say. It's not really on point on the legal, like it's legalese to have legalese is how I would interpret it. Like there's not really, it's not a legal thriller kind of story where it matters. It's just sort of, here's some bullshit. And it was so much. It was like these biggest long word bubbles of like jargon. Jargon I didn't need to know. Like you said, this isn't a legal drama. Like that could have been cut. We get Starfire actually pacifying Robin for once because he's about to like really act on his rage. Mm. And she's like, wait a minute, you told me not to do this. So why is it okay that you get to do this? It's fraught. I'd certainly rather they just happy lovey-dovey, but I do appreciate the way she gets the comeuppance to be like, well, you say I have to rein it in. So why aren't you? I mean, I really appreciated that. Honestly, that's one of the more modern moments in the 80s Teen Titans, I would say. Yeah, and it shows like a true character growth, I think, for her, where she's like learning the ways of living in this planet that she's never been before. And like, she notices when something's off. And there's definitely a lot of offness to the end of this volume in terms of where the team is. Like, Hmm. there's drama. There is like so many people contemplating leaving the team. Even Donna at one point is like, I don't know if I could go on with the team because I'm going to be engaged or to be married. She hasn't made the choice yet. 
so maybe this is a good jumping off point for me. And I'm just like, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> Wally and Roy, Roy, I think Roy left uh, yeah. an issue ago. We didn't even need to talk about it. He was just gone. Great, good. Goodbye. Well, he announced he was leaving, but did not leave. But did not leave. <laughs> Amidst their conversation, an assassin was trying to kill them and subsequently was killed themselves, but we don't mm-hmm. know who did it. And then <laughs> this is where, uh, right before we get into like the this deep dive Suicide Squad-esque intro of all these characters, Raven kind of tries to find seclusion and respite in Azeroth. So she goes there which is why she's absent for this whole issue for the most mm-hmm. part. And Ezra's like, nah, you, you were not allowed. <laughs> you're just, uh, you don't understand what being barred means. It means you're not allowed in here. Good luck, have fun, I guess. Mm-hmm. And I just feel so bad for her. Like, regardless of her uh, perception of what Azrath is or what our perception of Azrath is, that's where she grew up. That's where she called home. And to like, just be, you're not even, no, we have one conversation where you're not allowed and that's it and you leave. It was very tragic. And then we don't see her for the rest of the issue because then we get this long intro with all these characters, all these villains who are, oh my God, I was like trying to like keep up. The only character of note that is great in here is Cheshire. We get Jade, uh, a common mainstay villain in Titans lore, uh, in Green Arrow lore. She becomes like really iconic. I didn't do the research to know if this was her first appearance, but I think it was. Which is cool. I didn't know her first appearance was actually in a Titans book. If it was. We get the Scorcher, who is somebody working for Hive, but also for Monitor. We get Spear. We get Bazooka. We get Slasher. We get Tanker. And then we get Cheshire. They're all kind of together or brought together by the Monitor to protect uh, Scar- Scatapelli. And then that leads to this inevitable battle. We get all these villains who... Uh, uh, they're, who cares? They fight the Teen Titans, right? There are a lot more questions than answers here. Like, how does Beast Boy's powers work? Because he gets stabbed in the tail and then he's just fine. I'm like, mm-hmm. wouldn't one of your appendages be bloody or something? Or then like she clips one of his wings. wings. And he says his shoulder is bleeding after that happens, although no blood is shown. Although no <laughs> blood is shown. So where would he have been like bleeding if the tail got stabbed? I don't understand. Yes. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> we get uh bazooka's overt fucking racism super just uncomfortable weird like gross. It, he gave and each person one note of personality and bazooka's was racist <laughs> racist just full-on racist and he has a bazooka like was not uh was not sad when he got assassinated and the ending of the issue is the vigilante coming into the fold and killing scott Apelli, who ends up being adrian chase this is the introduction of his character Another anti-hero, Punisher-esque character who is common within the Titans Mm. uh, canon, which is very interesting that this was his origin story all along, which kind of brings us to the last of the volume. This is the end. The kind of crazy conclusion to this story filled with overt racism, murder, uh, team fighting, too, too many characters to count because my brain was freaking hurting again. I'm like, this is the Omega Men all over again. Part two mm-hmm. of these villains who I don't care about, except for Sheshar right. because she becomes so iconic. Yeah, the How others are you... very disposable. And yeah. I was kind of furious with my notes. Like every time I turned a page, I was like, God damn it, I have to jot down another assassin name. But it's like, yeah, I was did, I, out of room. did they matter? Because they really didn't like they could have been faceless minions like the guys who come out of the bomb shelter and like there was no need to introduce us individually to each of the mercenaries that you're going to shoot in the head in five panels later literally <laughs> but, there was no need for it this like suicide squad-esque introduction for these characters for them to just get off i mean in a greater scheme of things on a macro level sure i think it's cool that like there are so many more villains than we realize except for sheshar because she is arguably iconic mm-hmm. uh and her intro outfit is pretty great i was like, really shocked by the lack of mask like it just yeah, didn't click to me yeah she doesn't have a mask until young like, justice you call yourself cheshire but you have no grinning mask what like what i don't know why but... she called herself that i don't get it <laughs> <laughs> like the alice in wonderland reference is completely lost on me because there's no cap mm-hmm. motif anywhere nope. like she has like the sharp nails but that's it she's introduced uh, in hong kong and given a very 
not entirely sensitive cultural treatment, which makes you wonder like why Lewis Carroll, if she's so Hong Kong pseudo Chinese, but yeah. It doesn't make <laughs> sense. It's like, you can't help but laugh at like the ridiculousness of where they must have gotten these ideas from. Well, right? I guess like, if Hong Kong was a British colony, then you could argue that Lewis Carroll as a British author could have been introduced to her as like a strong formative figure, but we're getting, it's weird. <laughs> it's weird, it's just <laughs> darn and weird. The, the, the thinly failed straws that we're picking at here to make sense of it all. Sometimes it, comic books are comic books, very strange. I think this volume especially gets sort of darker and edgier. I mean, we've had people dying all along and various concerns all along, but I feel like it really reaches a new level at this point. And it speaks, I think, to the earliest point I read from Marv Wolfman and his forward to volume one about the idea of, which I agree with, I do not like kid heroes, teen heroes, when they're portrayed as this goody goody or kind of dumb or more just sort of there to be the sidekick who makes the hero look better. I prefer this treatment where, you know, they're teens, but they are still people. They are yeah. becoming adults. They have adult problems and desires and concerns. And when I was a teen, that was definitely what I was craving. I would be so upset if you're like, here's your teen book. And they pick up litter and then go to a community center. Like I oh. want the murder and sex. <laughs> it's fascinating to me how just, it's gonna be crazy when we do the golden age uh, retrospective episode because I want to know like the structure of comic books back then in the sixties versus the structure of it now in the eighties. I, I do like that. Like the tone, the minute, like the minute Tara betrays the team, things get wild, but that is it for volume. Is this volume four, volume five? I five. volume five. Sorry. I'm just, whew. <laughs> so much of this issue or this volume is just like, whew. like there's just so much to go through. And those last couple names really just irked me. Also, editors note, we are not doing Sheaker Week for any of these dum-dums except for Jade because she is the only one that matters. In, in my opinion, everyone else is a week yeah. across the board. And like borderline offensive. Ugh. Speaking of though, that gives us Sheaker Week. Tara, she drops the fake hair and the headpiece. She's in now her full on like onesie. Uh, what do you think of her outfit? Um. I know you don't like the brown and the yellow. Yeah, I'm not crazy about the color palette, and I don't know, it's mostly similar to the original outfit, I would say, except that she drops the headdress and pants, which I'm always a little critical of. Um, <laughs> I, I think all superheroes would be better served to wear pants than not. Um, uh, I know he's thinking of Polaris. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's fine. I don't, again, I feel like the brown and orange doesn't necessarily convey the earth idea especially well is the only thing. I feel like a more thematic costume could have helped, but yeah. Mine is completely off of bias alone. I love the characters. So any costume, most of her costumes that she wears are like just little precious designs to my heart uh it's gonna be a, a chic for me the only costume that i really don't care for and i get thematically why she wore it is her costume in the cartoon when she betrays the team the mm. like tattered pieces of like cloth with like slade's armor on her hate that outfit <laughs> but i mean that's like the only one i don't like everyone else every other outfit is iconic to me um and she's on my cosplay list one of these days when i don't want to cosplay down at Troy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have Thunder and Lightning. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you think of their costumes? I kind of touched upon it a little bit in the main uh, the main review. I uh, mean, what do you think? to our earlier points about research, I don't think there's any like accuracy here, and maybe that's culturally inoffensive in and of itself. But yeah. in terms of just looking at them visually, I like them. I mean, they're a matched set with highly contrasting colors, but 
I think George did a nice amount of detail in like the little textures they sort of have going on the armor bits. Mm-hmm. It sort of reminds me of Starfire way in a few places. Um, I don't know. I think they look elegant. They. My main concern would be that this was someone's idea of like stamping it Asian. But yeah. It's... From my my standpoint on it is completely from like the color story. I love the di- the difference between like blue and orange and. Yeah, they're supposed to be brothers, but they're also supposed to convey their power set. And I think that really does it. I know that like for lightning, oftentimes it's like always to yellow, but I think it's cool when you compare like the, the, uh, the color schemes between the two of them as characters. So it's a definite cheek for me. We do have the bad guys of the issue or of these issues. Uh, we'll start with Sheshire, who mm-hmm. I love. I love this like green, mm, monochromatic moment she has again i think to your point it like how much of it uh was researched uh because it's definitely strange at points i think knowing where her costumes go and how they really include the motif of like alice in wonderland to her namesake it kind of elevates the costume a lot more from her origins so based off of knowing where her costume goes, I think I'm going to have to give it a week. It was the 80s, but we've got a headband. We have an asymmetrical mini dress where there's one giant billowy sleeve and no sleeve on the other side. We have leggings plus pirate boots. It's it's a lot. I, it's a lot. I can't endorse this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, Aside from like the green, which I love on her, mm. it's like, what are you doing? What are we doing here? We have Vigilante. What do you, what are your thoughts on his outfit? The like mm. weird blue, yellow, and red. It's I don't understand fine. the inspiration for it. No, I feel like the big sort of V on his chest is sort of all it has going in that regard. <laughs> um, let me, is there a better shot of it here? There we go. Um, I mean... If you consider it Punisher with the serial numbers filed off, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's very similar to Punisher in that regard. It honestly uh, is. I, yeah, weak. This isn't George's best work. It's a week. Uh, ironically enough, his costume does not change. Throughout <laughs> he was in a very prominent book towards the end of the New 52, or towards the end of the pre-New 52 era of Teen Titans. And his costume is like, exactly the same I'm like uh, can we get an upgrade for you because it's boring it's a week for me and that leaves us with trident who has the i think arguably the goofiest costumes costumes they're all the same costume worn by three different people of the entirety of this list uh it's a week i yeah. the purple and yellow strange the weird like corset that goes up to his chest strange Even his the colorist cool. gets confused like from yeah. panel to panel, it's not the same pattern because they no. look at it and they're like, uh, here? <laughs> if I was a cosplayer trying to make that costume, I'd blow my brains out because I'd be like, <laughs> I don't even know what I'm doing. I have no idea. <laughs> How do I go about making this as accurate as possible when the artists, the artists couldn't even like decide for themselves? And yeah, that brings us to the end of this volume. Uh, do you want to bring up the exciting announcement for volume six? Yes, uh, we will yes, have sorry. a special guest, my amazing and beautiful husband, whose Nightwing collection is part of my background at the moment, because we correspondingly love Starfire and Nightwing, respectively. Um, it should be a good time. Yeah, I'm excited. From volume six onward, we're going to try to have a guest on as much as possible. I'll really bring in some exciting and new perspectives. And I think the next one is the Judas Contract. So we will get into the nitty gritty of how Tara decides to betray the team, which is tragic and heartbreaking. And I can't wait to just d- deep dive into that content because it's pretty great. And yeah, I think that'll be it. If you want to find us collectively, we do run the Titans Together podcast Instagram over at, at Titans Together pod. We post kind of regularly, irregularly, just because we have both have busy schedules, hence why this is a monthly podcast. I am working on getting those t-shirts because I am for ever a procrastinator and uh, just haven't gotten around to like just adding it to my cart on T Public. but you can find them at joe pride art on T Public. we do have official merch look for other um posts in the near future some of them teen titan related 
And where else can we find you specifically, James? I am at GeekyJP on Instagram. And you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joe Pride Cosplay or Joe Pride Art and Cosplay. I'm easy to find. <laughs> and until next time, I'll see you later. Bye.